Hello and welcome to BCM 215 Game Media Industries. In this lecture, we are going to focus on changes occurring in the game media industries between the 1980s and the 1990s and focus on the rise of celebrity video game makers and the shift from game developers to game designers. We're going to start with reviewing the studio model of game production, and then we're going to continue to develop our understanding of the media archaeology method with a focus on two key figures in the video games industry, Shigeru Miyamoto and Roberta Williams. The term studio system comes from the golden age of Hollywood between the 1920s and the 1960s, in which the American cinema was dominated by a small number of major studios. By combining both film production and distribution and controlling the exhibition and screening of movies, early Hollywood had a major commercial advantage until the Supreme Court ruled in 1948, forcing the separation of these elements within the industry. Not quite to the same degree as Hollywood, but in the late 1970s and 1980s, we see a similar type of studio system emerge in the game industries, where companies like Atari and later Nintendo, and even later still Sony, Microsoft and others, own and produce game consoles and license and control the production of content that operates on those consoles. As we saw previously, Nintendo had a much stronger licensing arrangement than Atari, which meant it could survive the video game crash of the 1980s. And companies like Sega, Sony and Microsoft learned important lessons from Nintendo during this time in terms of producing both quality games and limiting the access to their proprietary hardware by outside companies wanting to publish on that platform. The idea of a game developer studio actually comes from the notion of the artist studio, which emerged in the 15th century, particularly in Europe, but it has ancient precursors in almost all cultures. Also known as ateliers, artists would learn their professional craft by working alongside established masters and practitioners. The print industry developed this system, eventually establishing entire publishing houses which paralleled the studio system, and other industries also took on this model, including, of course, radio, film, movies, television, and eventually games. All of these creative industries came to be dominated by a style of studio production that is organised around this model. My colleague Ted Michu and I talk about the spatiality of games as one of the important dimensions for thinking about the history of video games. Spatiality is typically considered in terms of the places that games are played in, but the game studio is a crucial space to consider in terms of how games are designed, produced and made. This can help you to think about other types of physical locations and conceptual spaces that contribute to the production of games and the collective identity of the people involved in video game development, as well as the types of conditions that they experience in that process. We'll be coming back to this topic in later lectures. The success of production teams and game studios is the result of a highly standardised Fordist industrial process, enabling the rapid delivery of highly similar content with very little deviation in the quality of the product to very large audiences. The video game industry naturally gravitated towards this model of production in the late 1970s, but during the 1980s, most studios actually refused to credit their development teams, and lead designers would go unacknowledged in the publication, the packaging, the material and the marketing around games. So the top talent that were published, that were working on these games, weren't allowed to have their names on their creative work. The classic example of rebellion is the Atari game Adventure, designed by Warren Robinette for the Atari 2600. Robinette hid a secret object that could be used to access a hidden area of the game that featured the words created by Warren Robinette. This is the earliest known example of a video game Easter egg, and it changed the way the industry and game fans thought about game designers and their creations. So one of the points I want to explore further in, in this lecture is the distinction between game designers and game developers. We'll come back to this point 
in a little while. But my first kind of thoughts are that sometimes these terms are used interchangeably. Designer and developer are, are kind of synonymous, particularly in different parts of the industry and, and different parts of the way the media covers the industry. Personally, I tend to view a game developer as someone who codes software directly or at least oversees the production of the video game code or is otherwise involved in the production of the game's technical elements from the interface to the sound, the visual elements, character interactions and so on, right? The technical code elements. While a game designer does not necessarily have to be actually working in the code, of course, a game designer is going to benefit from being able to code and being able to work with their team on the game's code, but they are responsible rather for the overall design of the game and the way it plays. And they are responsible for designing the game experience as a whole, rather than sitting there and coding those specific elements. This is why the studio system is actually so powerful and works so effectively because you can have a lead designer or a lead design team working with sub teams to help bring that design to life. The role of the lead game designer or game developer is given special attention because game audiences responded to that idea that games came from the mind of specific individuals similar to other media types and not necessarily the products of kind of faceless corporate brand identities. Take, for example, Shigeru Miyamoto. His influence at Nintendo represents the transition from game developers, who were mainly programmers trying to do the most with the limited technology of the time, especially at companies like Atari, to game designers, who were typically more traditionally trained visual artists. Miyamoto demonstrated that with a good team of developers to support his vision, Nintendo as a company could make the most of the affordances of a new generation of technology in the late 1980s and early 1990s. In cinema theory, the term auteur signifies a film director or artist who has a distinct control over the style and substance of their work. An auteur's work might have a visual consistency or a mode of storytelling across multiple texts. A kind of classic example is, of course, you know, Tarantino. An auteur might connect several of their movies via different themes or by connected characters. The term was actually used to distinguish between Hollywood studio system directors and French New Wave filmmakers, but it has been since used to identify directors like Alfred Hitchcock. Even Michael Bay can be considered a type of auteur, regardless of what you think about his actual work, who are working inside the studio system. And of course, again, Tarantino is a, is a great example here. Going back to Nintendo, Miyamoto joined Nintendo in 1977 and his first project was Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong pioneered what would become the platform genre. As a side note, I would highly recommend the documentary The King of Kong, A Fistful of Quarters from 2007, which is available on YouTube. It's a documentary by Seth Gordon, which explores the story of Steve Wiebe, who was challenging the high score record of the 1981 arcade game version of Donkey Kong. And it's a, it's a really great uh, documentary and a really interesting game media paratext, an example of the kind of thing that you could do an analysis for your digital artifact. So Donkey Kong is an important landmark. It ushered in the kind of golden age of video games and paved the way for the launch of the NES in 1983. The popularity of Donkey Kong and Nintendo's promotion of Miyamoto as the lead designer meant that he almost immediately took on a star quality in Japan and the United States and around the world, and he became a celebrity quite clearly with the launch of Mario Brothers. One of the issues and one of the problems that I want to point out here is that when we focus on the lead game designer, we often overlook the entire production team. And I'm not advocating that you do that here. I'm, I'm recommending absolutely that you think about the role of the lead designer in the context for your game analysis. But don't underestimate the, the value of paying attention to others in the production team because there'll be a range of statements that they make by social media, in interviews, they'll be present on panels and industry talks at games conventions. And all this media will be out there that includes their thoughts and ideas about the game. They may even be included in some of the marketing and advertising strategies. 
All of these are important paratextual voices that you can take into account in your game media analysis as part of the broader context of the game development. The Super Nintendo Entertainment System was released in Japan in 1990 as the Super Famicom, and it was released in 1991 in North America as the SNES. It didn't reach Australia until 1992. It was the best-selling console of the 16-bit era, with almost 50 million units sold before being discontinued in 2003. Compare that to the Nintendo Switch, which sold 35 million units in just two years and is considered to be one of the fastest selling consoles of its generation. In what's known as the console wars of the 1990s, there was a strong rivalry between the SNES and the Sega Genesis, which was actually marketed by Sega as the kind of rebellious, cooler system compared to Nintendo's more wholesome family image. History repeats itself, of course, and there are very similar kind of console war arguments made about the PlayStation 3 versus the Xbox 360, um, and this goes on with every generation. You can talk to various fans and, and various media industry reporters and reviewers and, and journalists and so forth, and they'll have different views about which console is winning the console war and that kind of thing. What I want to point out here is that the notion of a console war is actually just a very effective marketing strategy. Although there are usually differences between hard hardware platforms, and of course there are subtle differences between console design, you know, the actual hardware console design internally and externally, as well as the design of controllers, uh, which has a very important role to play, absolutely. But in, in many instances, these, these differences come down to personal preference and aesthetics. There's actually very little choice in the marketplace when it comes to consoles, especially when compared to, say, PCs. Uh, although, of course, you know, PCs, the hardware choices are much broader, but the operating systems aren't. The thing I want to emphasize here is that choice in the marketplace is usually a good thing, and it leads to diversity of options for consumers. But remember that such things usually boil down to choosing between different flavors. And I don't recommend um, getting too involved in this as part of your game media analysis, or at least its analytical framework. Rather, it should play into the kind of contextual uh, environment of what's going on around at the time you are doing uh, at, at, the, at the time of the release of the media text that you're analysing as part of your digital artefact. Miyamoto continued to build his reputation as a video game auteur with the 1993 release of the Star Fox video game. Star Fox was an exciting, forward-scrolling, 3D flying shooter game that used the Super FX chip to create the first accelerated 3D game experience on a home console, which was previously only available in arcade game cabinets. By this stage, Miyamoto's name was well known enough in Japan and the US to attract instant consumer attention. And this model of celebrity games designers is now a staple component of marketing and advertising in the industry. In the early to mid-1990s, names like Sid Meier, Will Wright, John Carmack, Shitoshi Tajiri, others like Ron Gilbert, Hideo Kojima, and Richard Garriott became synonymous with specific styles of gameplays or genres, and that they were foundational genre titles um, that were the, pr the production of, of these designers, like SimCity, Pokemon, Doom, and of course The Sims. You might notice there a lack of women in that list, and we're going to be addressing that very issue in this lecture, uh, and also in the reading this week. Star designers and developer personas can become problematic for their games companies, especially as representatives of the studios, when these prominent personas become contentious for whatever reason. Also, and I really want to reiterate this point, as I mentioned previously, the focus on star personas makes it easy to overlook others involved in the studio and design teams who contribute significantly to games development. And I'm, I just want to re-emphasize the point here that you shouldn't overlook the role of sound engineers, character and level designers, even community managers now that all have important roles and influence over the game's development. A further aspect to consider is the, the focus on who did what 
can lead to overlooking the larger processes of how games are actually collectively assembled, produced, marketed, and distributed. It can also lead to overlooking the conditions under which it was made. And this points to the relationship between the studio, the studio's um, publisher, the game's publisher, for example. And we're going to come back to this in in future weeks. But I, I just, it, it's interesting to point out why Anthem was received so badly in in 2019 because a lot of the games reviewing and the and the, the media coverage of this game focused on the relationship between the problematic studio development cycle, the games for service model required by its publisher, and the increased monetization of play and the broader paratextual industries that were associated with the game's media marketing and advertising. Very little attention, particularly leading up to its launch, was actually on the game's design rather than how rather it was focused on how the game failed to live up to the promises that its lead designers were making in the um, in a kind of hype cycle building up to its release. As part of your analysis, it might also be useful to examine other games that the production team and also the game's publisher has made, as it helps to understand the broader context and culture of creativity that these titles are operating within. And by examining the intertextuality between these titles and other media, we can begin to see trends emerge and detect patterns in the production cycle. To go back to the point I was making earlier about Atari um, and the game Adventure and its producer Warren Robinette, Fernando Vara notes, In the 1980s, Atari did not list the names of engineers who worked on their cartridges, which caused many of their best programmers to leave and create their own company, Activision. Many home computer games were circulated with no names attached to them, particularly if they were distributed in magazines as code to be typed into a computer. So, while individual designers and entire game design teams were unknown in the early 1980s and even into the early 1990s, the mid to late 1990s was a period of auteurship that continues well into the 2000s and today. However, as you might have noticed, and as I pointed out from that list of game developers and designers earlier, video game histories tend to overlook and underestimate the importance and role of female developers in this time period. This is where the article in the reading by Lane Nooney is useful, because it highlights this problem and uses the media archaeology approach that we've discussed in previous lectures. Indeed, Nooney's article is an excellent example of media archaeology that uses material elements like box art, photographs, screenshots, images, and interviews to reframe the question, where are women in games history, to the much more interesting question, why are women there in the way they are? This is an important reframing of the question as it moves to a much more complex and critical question about presence rather than assumed absence. Also note, rather than a historical timeline, Nooney's article approaches an examination of this question through a series of non-chronological vignettes, which are basically stories and case studies about the co-founder and the lead designer of Sierra, Roberta Williams. As we saw in previous weeks with the uh, Erki Hutamo reading, video game history is typically obsessed with the collection of facts about video game objects, resulting in a history that is unable to be related to broader cultural frameworks. Personally, I argue that some knowledge of key facts, dates, times, and technologies is important to a comprehensive understanding of game media history and the current conditions of the game media industries. But Hutamo's version of media archaeology expands this approach, not only considering the most successful and popular, but also includes the innovations and important contributions of failed and dead media. He does not leave history behind. He does this through a medium specificity rather than a representational one. Lane Nooney takes this approach, but rather than focus on the core material technologies, her version of media archaeology focuses on humanist and cultural specificity. I'll explain what I mean by that as we go through the article. Nooney describes her approach as speleology, which refers to the scientific study of caves and underground structures, commonly known as spelunking. Her methodology is phenomenological which refers to the study of phenomena 
from the individual's perspective of personal experience. Phenomenology is interested in personal experience as a means for understanding broader historical conditions. In the article, Nooney seeks to understand Roberta Williams and her experience of the video game industry in the late 80s and 1990s through an analysis of archival elements from Williams' career to provide insight into a history of game development and a particularly important figure in that history and further then broaden that examination to explore the culture of games playing and the development of the industry in general. Notice in this article that Nooney includes her own personal experience and her personal perspective in the essay. And she writes about being unsuccessful at playing games and moving away from the culture and the industry in her early life. She writes, By now, I do understand why some would not feel that pull. I understand the frustration of not knowing which buttons to push, of being unfamiliar with the conventions on the screen, of being reluctant to invest hours, days, and weeks into playing this game, of being indifferent to the fiction of the game, of having a stupid machine tell you that you have failed, of being unable to fit a game into your life. This is really important narrative because typically we understand games through the lens of game fans and game players, the types of obsessions and interests and passions that we have about video game and video games, and that often drives our analysis. Notice that Nooney is not dispassionate here, but rather she is investigating the frustrations and the affect that she felt earlier in her life when dealing with games and reflecting on the types of investment, both emotionally and time-wise, that games require of their players in order to invest in them. At the age of 27, in 1979, Roberta Williams was the co-founder of Online Systems, later called Sierra, which produced software for early microcomputers, what we know now as PCs. Roberta, like Miyamoto, was not a programmer, but a game designer, and over the course of three weeks, she wrote the script for Mystery House, the 1980 adventure game, and she convinced her programmer husband, Ken, to write the code for the game. Using graphics and images that Roberta drew herself, Mystery House is recognized as one of the first graphic adventure games, and it was an instant success. Williams then went on to write the massively popular King's Quest series throughout the 1980s and 1990s, as well as other game series. One game that I really want to point out is the game that Williams wrote and designed in 1995, the highly contentious Phantasmagoria an adult horror game that featured live-action video and 3D locations. Phantasmagoria was a point-and-click game with supernatural violent themes, and it is known for a contentious rape scene, which caused it to be refused classification in Australia, which means it was actually banned from sale here. This, of course, did not stop distribution, and it was quite an accomplishment to have a copy of the game in Australia in the late, in the late 1990s. Williams herself has said in many interviews that she is the most proud of Phantasmagoria among all her games because she views it as her most successful writing. She appreciates that it was well received by adults looking for a more mature video game experience. Williams is often singled out as an exception in the industry, an anomaly, or put on a pedestal because of her gender. But Nooney argues what is most interesting about Williams is her departure from Sierra and her retirement from game design in 1999. For almost two decades, Williams did not engage with the industry, and it is this putting down of games that interests Nooney the most. The media archaeology here doesn't focus on failure in terms of Hitamo and Pariki's model, but rather the moving away from games, the kind of change in life and attitude and approach and desires that influences someone to put down this game designer lifestyle and their interest in games and move away. Nuni writes, Is the weird historical trick here that what we have written thus far are not histories of gaming, but history of gamers, and that is why so much is left out. 
the curious lives of Roberta Williams, of Elizabeth Hood, of the women who make up the confessions of their ludic pasts to me at conferences, suggests that we may need to flip the sentence, what does it take for a life to fit a game? Within game history, the only people we have made historically visible are those we have organised ourselves to see, those who have made the game a certain type of culture. But there have been others. In the case of my colleague in Denmark, she forgot. In the case of the student, she went back to books. In the case of Roberta Williams, she gave up game design in 1998 and has refused to do interviews for nearly a decade. Always, always riffing on the same refrain, I don't do Sierra anymore. In the case of myself, I stand around trying to fill out the history, not of gamers' past, but of the bodies that mostly remain unsubject to our history. We're going to pick up this topic uh, in class this week, and I'm going to conclude the lecture here. But again, I just want to highlight the difference in understanding the approach here between Hutamo and Pariki's model, which focuses on dead ends and dead technologies and the material history of video games, and Nuni's approach, who is arguing that a history of gaming and games and the games industries is not just about gamers or players and games designers, but also about the non-gamers or the games developers who stop making games and do something else, or the no longer gamers, or the maybe players who think about playing one day in the future but might never get there. This is a particularly interesting reframing because we seem to have many generations of young people who grow up playing video games and for whatever reason in their early teens and early working life put games down and don't come back. Some will of course come back later in life when they have more time or when their children start playing games and some won't and that's a really interesting part of the game media industries understanding why people don't play as much as why people do play. I want to point out here that although we typically think of young male players as dominating the video games industry, particularly console platforms, statistically speaking, we're seeing more and more older women dominate the video game industry, especially in terms of revenue raised via mobile and social games. So there is just as many statistically older female casual gamers as hardcore, traditionally what we call hardcore, um, younger male gamers. That's it from me this week. Thanks for playing. <laughs>